Secure Financial Advisors, a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full informed investment decision. This is your money, your wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMV. Now, here's Joe Anderson and Big Al Clopine. Hey, good morning, everyone. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson, Big Al Clopine, hanging out for the next couple of hours, talking financial planning, retirement, uh, taxes. I don't know. You name it, we got it. Very important show today. Very important show. There's a couple of things that I want to get out right away there, Mr. Clopine. All right, what do you got? Is that every so often we kind of educate our listeners here on what Capitol Hill is thinking about when it comes to their overall retirement reform. Right. And... Lo and behold, what I have in my hand here is a summary of a 146-page report uh, from the Bipartisan Policy Center, and it's packed with ideas. Yeah, and you may not like them all. No. <laughs> I would say most people are not going to like any of them. <laughs> At least our listeners. And uh, so I want to dive in there, and Al and I are going to give you some insight on why they're thinking this, um, how long they've been thinking about it. And some strategies, if it do comes into law, um, what are some ways that you can continue to do the planning that you had planned out for yourself um, without having some of these hiccups? You know, because there's all sorts of different types of risks in someone's overall retirement, right? You got longevity risk, you got you know, inflation risk, you got sequence of return risk, you got term risk, credit risk, and then we have geopolitical risk. Yeah, I mean... Throw that on top of it, and uh, and why, why is it geopolitical risk? Why can't it just be political risk? I don't know. I, I'm they, not what, the right person to ask on that. They, I don't even know what geo means. <laughs> no idea. I'm sure our listeners know because they tend to be smarter than we are. Yes, but I have the document in my hand that they probably don't have. In true, I have the experience. Well, to sure. explain in layman's terms what all this stuff means. Yeah, so that's what we're good at. Yes, geopolitical. But everything else is Forget out it. the window. What does that mean? I don't know. Uh, so um, I'm going to dive in there because this could take a while because there's five or six things here. Yeah, um, and these are these are some changes. And uh, Joe, this uh, this is not the first time we've seen some of these proposals. So I got to believe that some of these are probably going to come through at some point. And, yes, most and, definitely. And I would say the sooner you know about them and can start uh, anticipating them, all the better, right? R- right, exactly. And so let's um, let's dive in. Okay. Wow. Right. Right off the bat. Huh? What the heck? You know? Okay. Sure. Hey, time's money here, okay. and uh, we got a lot of things to go through. We do. So, right off the bat, it's like, okay, well, high earners are probably going to feel a little bit of pain here. Right. And as the article says, a lot of high earners are going to hate it. <laughs> That's what it says. So let's go into Social Security. Okay. Right? So we talk a lot about Social Security on this program in regards to, all right, well, claiming strategies. Just recently, they changed the law um, last year in November. It came into effect. Um, the, the, the final regs, or for f- final people, uh, was April 29th of this year of 2016 when it came to filing and suspending your benefits to have a spouse claim a restricted benefit to claim the spousal benefits. And we've explained this a million times, and I'm not going to go into it in, in more detail than yeah, that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Listen to a podcast. Yes. It's too late anyway. Uh, yeah, right. It's like, well, why? Yeah, it's not harsh. Uh, but you can still file and suspend. Did you know that? Yes. Because you can still suspend your benefits and still get the 8% retirement credit right. and claim it later. Yeah, sure. But you can't get a spousal benefit. You cannot. Yeah, you and, have unless, to be claiming your benefit. Unless you're already over 66 and all and that or, stuff. And already yeah. been claiming Yeah, right, okay, right. Whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, so right now, then we get this comment too. Um, all right. Well, Social Security's going broke. Right. Well, the trust fund now, the OASDI fund, I think the last I saw was 2037. Yeah. And that, actually, they've revised it to 2033. Or 2034. In other words, that the trust fund itself would run out of money. But they revised it again, and it increased oh, a little bit. Oh, they did? I missed. Yes. Back to 37 again? 37. Oh, I missed 2037. I'm behind then. Because he, but here's another thing, and I, I, we're going to go on tangents all day, I have a feeling. <laughs> but you know what's uh, the, the largest demographic is not the baby boomers. 
It's the millennials. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen that too. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's more millennials than there are baby boomers. Right. And so, yeah, because the problem was always the baby boomers, the biggest generation ever. They're going to get to retirement age, and there's going to be not enough workers. Yeah, yeah. To support there's them. no one, no, no one's alive. And now we got the millennials that are even more plentiful. So they will be working. Yes. And so I think it will be kind of an ebb and flow. Well, and, and of course that that's supposedly already factored in. But part of the thing about Social Security, Joe, is that, uh, and probably a lot of people don't realize it, is there's limits. It's certain income limits. They stop withholding Social Security. So right now it's one hundred eighteen thousand five hundred dollars. In other words, if you make more than that, you don't have any more Social Security withheld. It you max out, right? And if you want to know what that is, that's six point two percent of your wages, right? So if you make $100,000, 6.2% of $6,200 is withheld from your pay. You get past 118500 they stop withholding that. Right, then you have to pay Medicare. Medicare. Which is another point and a half. That's right, and it's, yeah, exactly. 1.45% Medicare. Now, that used to be aligned with Social Security years ago. It also stopped at a certain income level, but then several years ago, they, they, they kind of bifurcated. I, that's a nice word, right? That's good. Bifurcated. That's smart. <laughs> it's, uh, that just came to me, too. <laughs> wow. <laughs> anyway, um, so so they've made it where the Medicare withholding, 1.45%, there's no limit. In other words, you could make $20 million in salary. I'm not sure who does, but let's just say you did. You'd have to pay Medicare tax, 1.45% on all of that. Social Security right now stops at that 118500 Right, and that's earned income. So earned that's income. wages. Yeah, wages. So or, if you have, yeah. you know, if, if you're pulling $20 million you know, out of a, a stock portfolio, you know, right. like Buffett and things like that. They're, they're paying capital gains. It's not necessarily earned income. Yeah, earned income. So and it's your wages, uh, yeah. self-employment income, and things like that. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realize if you have, like, let's say you're already over the cap. Let's say your salary is 120000 and if you're self-employed and still making more income, subject to self-employment tax, which is essentially the same tax, well, you've already hit the cap. It's the combination of the two. But here's the proposal from this bipartisan policy center. They want to increase it to 195 thousand from 118.5. In other words, that 6.2% would go all the way to 195,000. And by the way, you may not know this, your employer is also matching that same amount. So you pay 6.2%, so does your employer pays 6.2%. Right, so it's actually twelve point four percent going in uh, for Social Security for your first hundred eighteen thousand five hundred in wages. And Joe, this of course is not new. The, this uh, the, uh, this cap has been increasing over time, and in, in some cases substantially. When Social Security has had problems before, and it's it's partly why we have said in the past that Social Security is one of those things that's fixable. They have fixed it before. They just raised the caps, raised the rates, and and so that's in the proposal. I would say if I was guessing, Joe, that this is pretty likely that something like this will happen at some point, I don't know, in the near term, near term being in the next five years. Right. I mean, there's different things that they can do to make Social Security solvent, right? They can increase the amount of money that they tax you on the earned income, which this is proposing right. from $120,000 roughly to about 200000 bucks. Right. So you look at, all right, well, that's $80,000 of additional earnings that we can potentially get another 6.2% on. Um, for all the individuals that make that money, yeah, right? and so that's just that, and that's a big tax. When you take a look at that tax, six, right, and that's a, it, it, it's not a gradual tax. It's not a marginal tax, right? Yeah. The payroll tax is payroll tax, right? So when you look at um, federal income tax, you start at ten percent, fifteen percent. So you have to look at the effective rate, right? And right. The, other, the other thing that makes it difficult, Joe, is is that six point two percent gets deducted from your pay. But you still have to pay income taxes on the whole amount without regard to that 6.2%. So it's, it, it's, it's tricky. And then you have to pay state taxes also on the gross pay. So you got three things coming off the gross pay before you even get any of the net. So, I mean, I guess the bottom line is, is if you don't have a retirement plan today, here are three reasons why you should. It could help you identify unnecessary risks you're taking now with your money that you didn't even know existed. We're gonna go through several different risks here when it comes to changes in the overall retirement landscape. It could reveal new ways to make the most out of every nickel that you save for in retirement. Plus, it could uncover the gaping holes in your plan or help avoid critical mistakes that could cost you thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars. Just getting started, don't go anywhere. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. This is Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. 
Hey, welcome back to the program. Show's called Your Money or Wealth. Joe Anderson here. I'm a certified financial planner with Alan Klopine. He's a CPA. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Go to our website if you'd like at purefinancial.com. Um, or check us out on the podcast. A lot of you are listening to our podcast. Uh, thank you for doing that. If you haven't, uh, you can go to iTunes. Uh, go to Your Money or Wealth and you could subscribe uh, to our podcast and you can get Your Money, Your Wealth right there on your smartphone, tablet, computer uh, every week. Just download it. Boom, right there. I suppose you could listen to us 24-7 if you felt like it. I hope that w <laughs> would be never the case. <laughs> I would say it's highly unlikely. I'm just saying you could. So um, Al and I are talking about the Bipartisan Policy Center. They packed up um, with some different ideas on retirement reform. Um, as we all know, we've talked about this time and time again on the show, is that the average balance of a retirement plan uh, for people that are approaching retirement is abysmal. There's not a lot of money saved. Uh, so something's got to give, right? So if you look at 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every day for the next, what, 13 years now, uh, and a lot of those individuals do not have adequate savings to provide a retirement income, Social Security is going to be the main source for a lot of those individuals. It, it is, and, and this kind of comes off the heels, Joe, of, of several studies, including um, a Federal Reserve uh, study in 2014. They said that 50% uh, of folks out there wouldn't even be able to be able to cover a $400 financial emergency without borrowing or selling something. So what does that tell you? It tells you, of course, you already kind of know this, but it tells you that a lot of people are not saving very much. So Social Security is more important than ever, right? They've got to, they've got to shore this up. They've got to secure it because a lot of people will be depending upon that as, as perhaps a lot of their income, if not their sole income. So the growing inequality has made retirement increasingly available to only a few. So we need a federal plan that serves everyone. This is a comment by one of uh, the commission members. Yeah. And so they're looking at some reform yeah. in regards to overall retirement. So Alan, I just talked about they're probably, um, and part of this um, bill is to increase the overall wage base of Social Security taxation. Yes. Uh, so right now it's about $120,000, $118,500. Uh, they want to increase that uh, to close to about 200000 bucks. Yeah, 195000 That would be by 2020. So in the next few years. Yep. 2020, yep. doesn't it? I mean, you look See, at that number, you I would know. think it's like 50 years from now. I, but it's, it's not. It's 2016. <laughs> yes. I mean, I remember thinking about the year 2000. I've my gosh, I'm going to be in my 40s. That's impossible. 2020, you would think we'd have flying cars. <laughs> Maybe we will. <laughs> Maybe we will. The way Google's going. Oh, boy. Um, so what? how does this affect you? So the report addresses an urgent need. Nearly half of all respondents in the Federal Reserve's 2014 household survey said they wouldn't even be able to cover a $400 financial emergency without selling something or borrowing money. That's what Alan just kind of alluded to. Never mind saving for retirement. So employer-defined benefit uh, retirement programs have largely been replaced by defined contribution plans. We talked a little bit about that last week with the, the, the creator of the 401k plan. Yeah, he said, let's scrap it and start over. Yeah, it's, it's, it's turned a monster. It's a monster. <laughs> that, was the, that was the highlight. And the, the reason he said that, twofold. One is the fact that companies are no longer providing a lot of pension plans. So that was a huge negative. And the second thing he didn't like is a lot of 401ks, Joe, are, are laden with fees. Uh, that's going towards th to the benefit of Wall Street. Not all of them. There's actually a lot of great ones too, but some are very expensive. Yeah, and I had my comment on that. And I'm not. <laughs> I, know. I think more and more small employers are not going to have their 401k plans because when you take a look at the TPA to set up the 401k plan, then you got to follow Safe Harbor 401k plan rules. Then you got to do the match. There's hop heavy rules. There's so many different rules and regs when it comes to the 401k plan in itself. Yes. And to have a third party administrator basically set up and construct the overall plan doc, and then you got to have to have that same firm or another tax firm to file the 5500s. It's expensive. It's expensive and complicated. And, Joe, have you heard this? Uh, that more and more employees are suing their employer because they don't have good uh, choices in the 401ks. Right. It, I mean, at least they have the plan. At least they do because a lot of people don't. Right. And, and then so then now there's what um, the tax report also includes revamps of everything from 401k plans to reverse mortgage and tax credits, encouraging savings. And it also recommends that any company with at least 50 employees that does not offer a retirement plan um, meaning certain standards, have to enroll workers in a new type of saving plan proposal in the report or enhance the MIRA. Remember the MIRA? Oh, yeah. 
or the my IRA. Yeah. I mean, what do you, you could put like six bucks in that thing and you're, you're you're stuck with treasuries and it works just like a Roth IRA. Why don't you just start a Roth IRA? Well, you know why they did that, Joe? Because they wanted to make it, they want to coordinate it with your employment, so it would be an automatic. So it would deduction. come out of your your paycheck. Because we know that most people, if left to their own devices, they will not put money into a Roth IRA. So that's why that came about. But but they, t- in my opinion, they could have done that a lot better method. Y- you think? Yeah. I, I think. mean. It, <laughs> So there needs to be reform. I definitely agree with that. But put someone in here that basically has a little bit of experience with this. right? Why don't you have reform where everyone has the same contribution limits, where where they are right now, $18,000 or $24,000 if you're over 50? Why is there all these different rules for IRAs and 401ks and 403Bs and TSPs and on and on and on. Right. So if I work for a large company that has thousands of employees, and if I make $100,000 a year, they allow me to put the $24,000 in if I'm over 50. Right. Now I get a job at a small startup, and maybe there's only five employees, or maybe I'm the employer, and I say, you know what? I want to start creating jobs on my own and kind of build my own business, right? Like the American dream. And so then I'm trying to set up a 401k plan. Then I got to spend 10000 bucks trying to set this thing up. And guess what? It's top heavy because I make $100,000 and my employees only make Fifty thousand bucks, so I can only put it right. I mean, the whole thing is a mess. Yes. I mean, we can simplify this thing fairly easy if you put Big Al into office. He's running in twenty twenty four. I am. I didn't know that. Okay, good. <laughs> so, um, so this report recommends uh, their policies if they're enacted. They say Al that retirement savings for middle class Americans would be increased by about fifty percent by twenty sixty five. Right. Um, in old age poverty reduced by one third from America from today's levels uh, today. Come on, how? I mean, I'm going to go through all of this with everyone, and there's no magic bullet here. <laughs> all it is is basically taking benefits away from individuals, and it's right more tax to the IRS. And then how's that tax that we're giving to the IRS going to funnel back to the middle class to have them increase their overall retirement? How? Do you tell me how? <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, well, let's not get too political. But I, well, I'm not I, getting I, political. I'm just being honest. I, I hear you, right? I mean, so I think what they're trying to get at here, Social Security needs to be shored up and fixed. Okay, so, so all right. So, so they're so, going to tax me now to $200,000. Yes, if I, I made two hundred grand, they are going to tax that's me. That's right. So, and so, so, so what, what does that mean? So all of our Social Security benefits are going to increase? No, uh, it's no, going to be the same? Of course, of course. No, it's just those that make more money and more successful will pay more, right? So that's that's one yeah, part of it. I'm fine this. with that, but they, I'm just saying here yeah. with this report of saying that all of a sudden the middle class now, th- th- they're going to get out of poverty because of a couple of tweaks with the overall retirement reform? Well, I don't know. I, I'm by, reading this. I'm finding it hard to, yeah, well, to see that. I guess what they're getting at, Joe, is with this Myra or something similar. Where the, it's oh, a, the Myra is going to cure it all. Where, <laughs> where, it's, where it's a forced payroll deduction. That's the key. In fact, there's already uh, there's already... Uh, uh, 401k plans that have um, forced savings. You know, in other words, you have to opt out if you don't want it. And those are becoming really quite effective. But uh, Joe, to me, this um, it really all comes down to creating an income stream in retirement. And a lot of this has to do with how it's going to be taxed, taxed, right? Because if it's Social Security, it's taxed. If it's your retirement account, it's taxed. And taxes don't stop when your paycheck does. In fact, when you tap your retirement nest egg, it, it comes with all sorts of new rules and opportunities. And instead of contributing to tax deferred plans that reduce your taxes, you start tapping those for savings, for income and paying taxes at your regular rate, sometimes very high rates. So as you near retirement, tax planning becomes more important than ever, but you must use a forward thinking tax strategy. You have more control over paying taxes in retirement, more than you think, actually more so than any other time in your life. All right, we gotta take a break. Show's called Your Money or Wealth. Don't go anywhere. Now back to Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the program. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. My name's Joe Anderson. I'm a certified financial planner. I'm with Alan Klopine. He is a CPA. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we're going through this bipartisan act. Not, It's not an act. I guess it's a group uh, that are throwing around some different ideas for retirement reform. Yeah, Joe, they just uh, came out with a 146-page report. And uh, one of the things I like about the the report is, or I should say the group, is it, it is bipartisan. There's all kinds of high-profile people, 19 different high-profile people from politics, academia, business, and the investment world. And so they're, they're coming up with some ideas to try to fix some of our retirement social security issues. And of course, the first segment we talked about, they, they want to maybe raise the cap 
on Social Security. Right now, you make more than 118500 then your Social Security withholding stops. They want to increase that to 195000 uh, by 2020. But related to that, Joe, is they also want to, uh, they're recommending a half a percent hike on Social Security taxes. So right now, it's 6.2 percent. It would go to 6.7 percent. Uh, up to that 195000 and I'm sure that would also be indexed for inflation as it is right now. And when we're talking about this, that, of course, means if you're an employer, your taxes will go up a half a percent also because Social Security taxes, half of it's paid by the employee, half of it's paid by the employer. So a half a percent increase for the employee and the employer is a 1% increase, and then you combine that on the fact that a lot more of our salary is going to be subject to that tax. Then they're also looking at spousal benefits would be capped. So here's what the spousal benefit is, is that you have your benefit, your retirement benefit. Let's say my benefit's 3000 If I was married, I could either take my benefit or half my spouse's, whichever is larger. So if my benefit is 3000 and my spouse's benefit is 3000 well, all right, we have the same benefit. However, let's say my benefit was $500 a month and my spouse's benefit was 3000 My benefit would get jumped to $1,500 per month. It's half of your spouse or yours, whichever's larger. So now they're looking at capping the spousal benefits. Today, with a significant majority of working age women working outside um, and not being housewives, right? So they're looking at, hey, you know what? We can't double dip here. So they're looking at um, capping the spousal benefit. What do you think about that? Um, I, I have mixed feelings. So, so part of me goes, yes, it's certainly a way to... Um, to shore up Social Security. And I do think that a lot of people that uh, get that benefit, they don't necessarily need it. On the other hand, I, I think there are certain families where that's pretty critical, having that spousal benefit. You know, and this report is saying here, like wives of men with high incomes are less likely to work than women in less affluent households, the report says. So the spousal benefit mostly benefits certain high income families who can afford to have only one earner in in. Um, in, in this way, undermines the pro, uh, progressivity of Social Security. Yeah, and, and you and I can, I mean, let's be honest here, Joe. You and I have several clients that we advise how to do this, and they don't really need the money. I mean, if we're being honest. Sure, sure. But, I mean, I mean the, the, the whole thing is kind of sexist, too. True. Wives. I mean, what uh, well, husbands. They, they should, nowadays, you, you should, they should have written it differently. I agree. So, yeah, I mean, um, we've seen a lot of women that make more than the, their husband. So the way it works now, as long as a marriage has lasted at least 10 years, a married or divorced person can draw on his or her own benefits or the spousal benefits, whichever is higher. The recommendation is to cap the spousal benefit at a level equal to the spousal benefit received by someone married to a worker in the 75th percentile of the earnings distribution. In 2022, the new maximum would be 843 bucks a month. Under current rules, the maximum monthly benefit in 2016 is 2,639, and the maximum spousal benefit based on that is 1320, according to the Social Security press office. Yeah. So what that means is so They're, they would cut the the max spousal benefit in half, basically. Well, not quite, because because it would go from 1320 to 843. True. Because that's the spousal. But yeah, it would be. You know, it would cut it by almost five hundred dollars, which that's that's about five or six thousand dollars a year. So it's it's not chump change. Six thousand a year times a twenty five year retirement. That's, a, that's well, significant. Well, no, it's only four years, right? Spousal? Or no? No, that's, no. no you're right. You're if right. I'm taking the spousal. You're right. You're right. Never mind. All right. Never mind. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So just stay tuned there. It's like, all right. Well, here. Now, usually. Okay, and this is a big usually, is that every time, well, I guess every time the Social Security has made a change to the benefits, everyone that was already collecting it was grandfathered. Right. So it's going to affect people coming in after the people that are already collecting, yeah. per se, if this goes through. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Now, of course, it's not law yet, but that's, that's what, that would be a, my strong inclination, because that's what they've always done in the past. So I guess you got to hurry up and age. <laughs> <laughs> sit out in the sun a, a long time and get those wrinkles and just go to the Social Security office and tell them, you know what, the birth certificate is wrong. You're right. actually 80 years old. I, I mean, th I think this is the first time in someone's life is that they wish they were probably a little bit older. 
<laughs> First time ever. I don't think they still wish that. Even, I think even, I would much rather be 20 years younger than be, being 65. Than get another $500 yeah. in <laughs> monthly benefits. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you could do a magic wand. So uh, I guess the point is with Social Security, like we said before, this is going to be a, a large portion of a lot of people's overall retirement income. And so they're probably trying to find ways to keep this thing solvent, but it's very difficult to get anything passed through Social Security. The last law that they passed, they snuck it in, and most people were voting on a bill that they didn't even know what they were voting on. Uh, agreed. Right? <laughs> and then after the fact, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. What, what happened? What, what happened to this? I wasn't aware of this. Why, why, you know, so, well, you know, these bills, they, they're like 1,800 pages. Who's got time to go through exactly. all Exactly. It's like, we want to pass this one thing, so let's put 18,000 pages full of BS <laughs> around so no one reads it anyway. No one will see. Uh, yeah, on page 847. Yeah, subchapter per, 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 C. Yeah, four. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we really want to get through. Here. Yeah, right, right, right. So um, so some changes are down, um, are, are coming. So I guess the biggest thing is that if you don't have a retirement game plan today, I mean, there's got to be reasons why you should. Most people need some sort of game plan to make sure that you understand all of the benefits that are coming to you. Are you on track, not on track? How much money should you be saving? Where should you be saving the money? What is the overall tax implications on the right retirement income that you're going to receive? Looking at Social Security, how much are you claiming from Social Security? When should you claim it? Should you claim it right away? Should you push it on to age 70? Is there other strategies that you need to do in regards to that? I mean, I got thousands of reasons why you should have a plan. All right, got to take another break. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. This is Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Welcome back to the show. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. My name's Joe Anderson. I'm a certified financial planner with Big Al Clopine. He's a CPA. Thanks for tuning in. Happy weekend, everyone. Hopefully you're enjoying the weekend. I know Al and I are. Talking about some changes, some retirement reform that could change the landscape of retirement, so they say. And um, we talked about Social Security. They're going to put a cap on the spousal benefits. They're going to increase the amount of money uh, that they're receiving in Social Security taxation on the amount of income. Uh, they're also now looking at maybe limiting the tax deductibility of mortgage interest, Alan. They are, Joe, and I guess we should say this is a proposal by the Bipartisan Policy Center, 146-page report that just came out. So this isn't law yet, but this is uh, this is a proposal. We've been hearing this for a while, Joe, limiting a mortgage interest, and it's already limited to a degree. Like, for example, when you buy a home, the IRS says you can deduct up to the first million dollars of debt, and then they say you can borrow another $100,000 for home equity debt for any use, right? And so you can add those two together. So the truth is you can borrow $1.1 million on your home and deduct it. Any debt that you have on your home, in excess of that, it's not deductible. So that's what we have currently. How about this? Let's say that I have a $500,000 home and I have a $100,000 mortgage on it. Right. Right. And then I refinance it and I pull cash out. Yeah. So you can. So pull- let's say I pull cash out to four hundred grand. Yeah, that's it's a good Can I write the whole 400,000 off? Not necessarily. Right. Yes. And so here's how the rule works. If you borrow that whole extra $300,000 for home improvements, yes, you can write that off. That's considered what they call purchase money interest or construction interest. In other words, it's it was money used to either buy a home or improve a home. Okay? So that's deductible up to that $1.1 million. But if I use that to put it in an investment. Yeah, if you use that to put it in investment, then what happens is the first $100,000, which is considered home equity debt, doesn't matter what you use for that. Everything else is non-deductible. Now, if, if in truth, you do put it into investments in, say, non-qualified account and buy stocks and bonds, you could argue that that interest is called investment interest. It's a different category. It's only deductible when you have investment income. But a lot of people, Joe, just use that money for to pay for college, right, or to pay for their lifestyle. They got, they got behind on Debt credit card. Consulting. Yeah, debt yeah. consolidation. That, you know, in your example, in that example, you had a hundred thousand dollar debt. You now have four hundred thousand because you took three hundred thousand out. The first hundred thousand of that new three hundred thousand dollar debt is deductible, but the other two hundred thousand is not. So, in other words, half of your mortgage is deductible; the other half is not. Now, how does the IRS catch this? It's very difficult for them to catch it. I, from time to time, I have seen this happen. They will actually do an audit where they go. Uh, they have one of their agents review the the county 
uh, uh, records as to what you paid for a property, and then they look at the interest that you're claiming, and if the t- when, if they're way out of whack, then they might audit you. So that does happen from time to time. So now they're looking at limiting the tax deductibility of the mortgage interest. Yeah, and the way that they would do that, Joe, is is basically they would say that as your home equity decreases and if you reborrow, you don't get to write that off. And so we just talked about home equity loans. So in, in, the, in what they're saying is you don't get to write off home equity loans probably for any purpose. Or if you've got mortgage debt on a second home or if you... Instead of refinancing your entire home, you just get a second mortgage, pull cash out. Or if you do refinance and pull cash out, they don't want you deducting that. And so uh, what I what I read between the lines here is that maybe they may be getting rid of the whole $100,000 you know, extra of what you can actually write off. The report's authors are concerned about Americans' debt, including the increasing level of mortgage debt among older people. In general, they add, borrowing against the equity in your home before retirement is likely a poor choice for many homeowners, as doing so can lead to greater debt and related expenses during retirement when income is typically lower. The recommendation, tax deductions should no longer apply to mortgage interest when home equity decreases, such as through HELOCs, home equity lines of credit, mortgage debt for second homes, second mortgages that reduce home equity, and refinancing transactions. I mean, they're just saying, okay, well, here, we don't trust you in your own devices because you're going to probably mortgage your stuff to the hilt. You're going to go in retirement, and you're not going to be able to afford the the mortgage. So we're going to disincentivize any type of debt um, that we have now that you can write some of that stuff off. Which I think that's a good idea. Okay. (laughs) And here's the reason. Because we showed uh, during the last bull market in homes, which was maybe 2000 to 2006. Yeah, yeah, five, six. People used their homes as piggy banks, and they borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and overspent. And now, of course, there was the Great Recession where real estate values went way down. A lot of people were in trouble. So not only did a lot of people lose their homes, but the ones that were able to hang on to their homes have way less equity. So... Is this won't stop that practice, but it, it makes it less, there's less of incentive. I, I actually think that's a decent idea. I don't like the fact that they want to tell me what I can and cannot do. Well, that you know, you know why they're doing that though. It's because so many of us have not saved enough, and if we're using our home equity to live our lifestyle, there's nothing left when we get to retirement. So that's what this is all about. Okay, so we've gone through, they're going to raise Social Security tax. They're going to raise the amount of money that they're paying um, that we're paying on Social Security. Yes. Okay. Up to about two hundred thousand dollars of income. Right. And then um, now they're going to limit the, the deductions on mortgage. Yes. So so far, do you think what we've talked about, Alan, that um, the retirement savings for middle class Americans would be increased by about fifty percent? Uh, no. <laughs> not yet. Okay. So we still got more to go here. Apparently, we got more to go because we haven't really touched that. Well. Partly, though, Joe, because the home equity thing. So, in other words, if people are not spending their home equity before retirement, they can use it actually in retirement. I think. So they can sell their homes and then yes. downsize and then use yeah. that. Interestingly enough, though, I just read a report that 83% of U.S. seniors want to keep their homes in retirement. True. So it's that's one thing to say you got equity, but if people don't want to sell, they don't want to sell. Right. right? So, but here's another thing, Joe, which is um, they're saying that retirement accounts, they want to limit them to $10 million. Okay. So most of us don't have a $10 million. Well, that, retirement there goes account. my plan. You know. <laughs> what in 2,150? <laughs> 200 years from now. Yeah. Right. And, well, of course, Mitt Romney, his, his uh, retirement plan has somewhere between 20 million and 102 million uh, per, you know, when he ran for president, he had to disclose that. It gave us quite a range. So no one knows exactly. But I guess I guess the idea is when you get to a certain level, you shouldn't really get the tax deductibility benefit. That's the idea there. But interestingly enough, I think it's the the, U, the government accountability office. They said uh, there's only 791 taxpayers in the whole country that have a have a retirement account more than 10 million. So this isn't going to affect too many people. 
I would say. <laughs> Only 791? Yeah, 791. But I, I think there, I mean, it's just a tipping point of starting to kind of change some different things here. So if you're not taking a look at reducing your taxes in retirement or figuring ways to making sure that you can protect yourself from unnecessary risks, right? Is that, okay, there's things that you can't control. There's things that you can't control. There's You can control the amount of risk that you take in your overall portfolio. There's uh, You can absolutely control your fees and costs. You can control your discipline um, in regards to what you do and react to the news and the media and how much money that you save or spend. And then another is, the I think the biggest one that we talk about is the taxation. If you, if you do a little bit of tax planning here, there's significant things that you can do with your money from a tax perspective to save more money for you and less for Uncle Sam. But you have to get a plan in place. Well, you do, Joe. And I think a lot of people kind of fail on this because they, they, they actually don't believe that they have that much control over their taxes. But the truth is, honestly, you have more control over taxes in retirement than any other time in your life. And I, I will say that there is so little good information out there on how to do this. And I'll, bet, I'll be willing to to bet your current advisors are not helping you in that regard because it's not necessarily their expertise. But there's a way to do it. You got to have a forward-looking tax-efficient strategy. All right, we got to take a break. Show's called Your Money or Wealth. 